Yes, perfect. So now we are recording. Thank you Great. so much, Stephanie. Um, so thank you all in general, of course, for joining us today. I'm really excited to welcome and again, congratulate Dr. Suzanne Mettler uh, for being nominated as this year's Zoom Scholar Series winner. Um, so I'm sure that everyone on here knows by now um, that this is an event that we typically do every fall and we typically host a well-known senior scholar in our field uh, to come chat with us about their research um, and their careers. So this is a decision that's made through student nominations. Um, so our PhD students do vote on, on who we want to host. So again, congratulations. Um, and we're glad to, to have you here with us, Dr. Mettler. Um, I also want to very quickly just thank all the students within SPAPSA, which is our uh, association for PhD students, um, for helping put this together. Um, especially Stefan, who just helped us out um, with the recording just now, um, Adam, Jill, um, and Ose as well. Um, and I also want to thank our, some of our uh, um, staff in the School of Public Affairs, um, including Dal View and Kathy Kilpatrick, um, as well as our Dean, um, Dr. Paul Teske. Um, I think he will be joining us here today. I know that he registered for the event as well. Um, so I just want to really quickly go through uh, Dr. Mettler's intro. I know some of you have already read it, um, just to formally introduce her. So Suzanne Mettler is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions at Cornell University's Department of Government. Her research and teaching focuses on American political development, public policy, and public political behavior. She is particularly interested in issues pertaining to gender and politics, race and politics, democratization, inequality, and citizenship. She is the author of multiple award-winning books, including Four Threats, The Recurring Crisis of American Democracy, The Government Citizen Disconnect, and The Submerged State, How Invisible Government Programs Undermine American Democracy. The first of those is um, what she'll be talking about and presenting about today. Um, Dr. Mettler has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and awarded Guggenheim and Radcliffe Fellowships. She serves on the steering committee of the Scholar Strategy Network and the board of the, Aca of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. She is the former secretary of the American Political Science Association and president of the organization's politics and history and public policy sections. She initiated the American Democracy Collaborative, a group of scholars of American political development and comparative politics who are evaluating the health of democracy in the United States. So just in terms of format for today, um, Dr. Mettler will be presenting to us for about 20 minutes, um, speaking primarily about her new book, um, Four Threats. And, um, and then we'll be opening it up to uh, more of a conversation. So as I mentioned earlier, feel free to ask questions, be it about the book, um, her general research agenda, um, and things of that sort. So without further ado, feel free to take it away, Dr. Mettler. Okay, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to, um, for you all to have chosen me to be your speaker this year. I'm just delighted. And of course, it's one of these um, odd things in this very strange and unsettling time that we've been going through where it's, you know, really next to impossible to travel and to come give a talk and yet it's actually easier than it has been in the past to for me to simply be with you this afternoon in Denver while I don't even leave my home in Syracuse, New York. Um, so it's, it's lovely to be with you and to have this opportunity. So um, really most of my scholarship has been focused on public policy and I imagine that that is um, an interest shared by by most of you who are here today. Um, but I'm actually going to speak about my most recent book that came out this summer. It's co-authored with Robert Lieberman. Both of us are policy scholars. But, um, but we both, a few years ago, came together to write this book um, with more fundamental interests in democracy, in the health of democracy in the United States. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about this book first. But once we then move into a discussion together, I'll be delighted to, to either talk more about that or to uh, talk about, you know, any of my other projects and policy feedback and so on. So whatever you'd like is fine with me. So, um, yeah, so uh, a few years ago, well, actually for, for many years at Cornell, um, I was teaching the class Intro to American Politics, big lecture class to um, hundreds of students. 
And I had taught this class when I was first out of graduate school in the 1990s um, and uh, actually swore I would never do it again <laughs> at that point in time. But then I came back to it in 2012. And it was really in many ways like teaching about a different country um, because so much had changed. I mean, polarization had become um, much more formidable at this point in time and inequality, which was already high in the 1990s, had grown further. And so I really felt like I was running to keep up to teach about all of these subjects that you teach about in the intro course. And then we got to the 2016 election and things became mind bending because suddenly even topics that had been long established, like that, you know, Americans regard their elections to be free and fair and legitimate, that started to come into question and um, the freedom of the press and so on. Uh, and it was really mind bending to me. And I would run into colleagues of mine, other political scientists who study countries elsewhere in the world, not the United States, but they study uh, the rise and decline of democracies elsewhere. And they would say things like, oh, we've seen this all before. This is very familiar to us. And they would talk about countries that had um, had democracies and had lost them, like Venezuela and Poland and Hungary and so on. And uh, they would say things like, well, you know, democracies, they don't last forever. They come and they go. And the United States has had a pretty good run. And I, I was sort of, you know, stunned by this. But I also felt like I had to learn from them because they seemed to have a better grasp on how to think about what was going on than I felt that I did. So soon after that, I was in conversations with other colleagues of American politics who, like me, um, study history. And we were asking ourselves questions like, has this happened before? Um, when did the United States develop some of these norms that we've been accustomed to, like the legitimacy of the political opposition and that kind of thing? So uh, starting in 2017, we formed this group, the American Democracy Collaborative, which brings together people who study the United States, both historically and comparatively, to look at the health of democracy. And this book project grew out of that. So let me set the scene for you. Um, political polarization had been growing for years, and each action by one camp provoked an even greater counter-reaction from the opponents. Then the president signed a law that made it more difficult for immigrants to attain American citizenship and easier to deport people who were deemed to be dangerous or from hostile nations. The president signed another law that allowed for the prosecution of journalists who openly criticized his administration. Each were efforts to weaken the political opposition. The year was not 2017 or 2020, rather it was 1798, and President John Adams had just signed the Alien and Sedition Acts. Adams' emergent party, the Federalists, defended the acts as essential for national security, or as one congressman put it, there was no need to, quote, invite hordes of wild Irishmen, nor the turbulent and disorderly of all the world to come here with a basic view to distract our tranquility, end quote. Indeed, no sooner was the ink dry on the US Constitution than Americans became deeply polarized. Public officials led the way. James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, for example, helped states governed by their emerging opposition party, the Democratic Republicans, to refuse to recognize the Alien and Sedition Acts. Ordinary Americans, too, took sides. Federalists and Republicans often resided in different neighborhoods and attended different churches. They each took on their own ways of demonstrating their patriotism. Sometimes violence ensued. As the decade proceeded, the conflicts intensified and the stakes grew higher. Political leaders had not yet developed the concept of legitimate political opposition, that groups could take different approaches to governing and compete with each other routinely through the political process. Politics took on the proportions of mortal combat because people viewed the very survival of the young nation as being at stake. Many Americans worried that monarchy might reassert itself, aristocracy would replace representative government, or some states might secede from the union and cause its demise. The point is that early American democracy was fragile. So the overarching question for our book is whether we should also be worried today. Is American democracy genuinely in peril? 
Now, there are sound reasons to think that it's not. We have the oldest constitution in the world with its system of checks and balances intended to fragment power. The United States is wealthy, a factor that makes the loss of democracy unlikely. And in addition, while the nation in the 1790s included institutions that repudiated democracy, most notably slavery, and I would argue did not become a full democracy until the 1960s and 1970s, Still, it's fair to say that democracy has progressed over time and become more robust and inclusive. Uh, and today it has many features of strength, two well-established political parties, uh, each with control of different parts of the federal government in many states, and active citizens who voted at, at higher rates this year than they had since the early 20th century, and active news organizations, and so on. So each of these make democracy today appear to be secure. On the other hand, it's not unreasonable to wonder whether democracy may be at the risk of deteriorating or backsliding. As we've learned from those who study democratic deterioration in other nations, these days we don't tend to see democracy taken at the barrel of a gun or canceled elections or the disbanding of the legislature. Rather, it tends to happen in more subtle ways. Typically elections are still held and yet democracy decays such that a nation becomes a hybrid with some democratic features, but not others. Um, and scholars call this competitive authoritarianism. In other words, we shouldn't be thinking of democracy having an on off switch where either a country is a democracy or it's not, but rather as being on a continuum. And the question for us at any point is whether the United States is moving in the direction of becoming a more full and robust democracy or backsliding in the direction of autocracy. So that's the task we take on in this book. We examine five earlier periods in American history when people were concerned that whatever extent to which representative government had been established or democracy had been established, that it was going to go in the other direction. And we observe the patterns that ensued and then we analyze our own contemporary period in light of what we've learned. So, um, so let me now um, share my screen with you. Uh, let's see. Am I going to do that? Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, you can see that. Here we go. Oh, I do actually. I, that's the wrong slide. Um, Wait one second. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. So so this is the, the cover of our book and uh, the recurring crises of American democracy or four threats. Um, and uh, and as I said, Robert Robert Lieberman is my my co-author. So um, so in the book we look at um, these. We we consider democracy to be a system in which um, there is a basic accountability to citizens through a system of representative government elected by citizens. Um, and so um, we think of it as having four um, pillars of democracy, free and fair elections, the rule of law, the legitimacy of the opposition, and the integrity of rights, by which we mean civil liberties and civil rights and voting rights. And these four features give us the indicators that we can assess in the five periods, um, as well as the present, to see whether democracy is uh, advancing or retreating. Um, and we've, uh, we've learned from, uh, from those who study democracy around the world that there are these four key threats. So if I show you the list here, they all sound quite familiar to you, political polarization, conflict over membership and status, high and rising economic inequality and executive aggrandizement. I'm gonna speak about each of those um, for a few minutes now. If we go to the first one, uh, political polarization. This is what we think of as when politics takes on the character of being, um, instead of a matter of negotiation and compromise, um, a matter of us versus them, when it starts to feel quite tribal. So um, this happens, um, we know that democracy works well when uh, there are multiple groups and identities in a society and people have overlapping 
and cross-cutting affiliations. So for example, um, you might affiliate with one party or the other, but you might belong to some organizations or um, a place of worship uh, and workplaces where you associate with people of the other political party. But what's problematic is when these differences increasingly line up and people sort themselves out into two camps. And uh, then politics um, can take on this character that's more like mortal combat instead of negotiation and accommodation and where opponents start to seem like enemies. And we've been seeing this on the rise in the United States in recent decades, both among um, citizens, among the public, and among law lawmakers. Um, so that's, that's the, the first threat. The next threat is what we call who belongs or conflict over the boundaries of the political community. So democracy works well when people agree on who is a member and what their status is. If there's an unresolved formative rift in the nation's founding over who is included, it can reemerge as a source of trouble again and again, whether it's a, a rift over race or ethnicity or gender. And in the periods that we study in the United States, battles over race take center stage again and again, especially concerning those who are most overtly excluded in the nation's founding, African-Americans. And what we find is the group um, that, that wants to preserve or reinstate um, hierarchies, social hierarchies, they want to preserve what they call our way of life um, at all costs. They are willing to run roughshod over democracy um, in pursuit of doing that. And it's particularly dangerous when this threat combines with political polarization and one party wants to um, reinstate some kind of uh, pre-existing hierarchy or previous uh, hierarchy and the other party wants to, uh, greater equality, things can get um, really contentious. Um, the third threat is rising economic inequality. And so scholars know that countries around the world where inequality is high and growing are more likely to suffer democratic deterioration. And when I first learned about this, I thought, you know, the idea must be that the 99% rise up and have a revolution. But that's actually the opposite of um, why a democracy becomes endangered. In fact, it's the affluent, the top 1%, who become worried that the masses are going to take power and impose policies on them, like higher taxes and redistributive policies that they don't like. So to protect their interests and to solidify their power, they are willing to support repressive measures if that's what it takes uh, to protect their interests at all costs. And of course, in the United States, we've had rising economic inequality since the 1970s. And increasingly, in the past couple of decades, the wealthy becoming very politically organized and mobilized. There's a lot of political science literature on this now. And then uh, finally, the fourth threat is what's called executive aggrandizement. Um, and this refers to the enlargement and concentration of uh, powers of the, the nation's top leader or in the United States, uh, the president. Um, and of course, the American presidency has been accumulating more powers, particularly since the 1930s. And in the main, presidents acquire more power so that they can respond to public demands. Um, but it it uh, leaves the possibility that you can have a president who wants to use those powers for their own personal and political gain. And that's the concern. And it's particularly concerning when it uh, comes about, as is now the case, um, together with political polarization, and you have a party backing up that use of executive power. Um, and you can have the weaponization of the presidency. So all four of these threats, if we look across American history, they've each had their own pattern and they've each waxed and waned and combined in different ways in American history. If you have even one threat alone, it can wreak havoc. Um, in the 1790s, the only threat that was really um, activated was political polarization. Um, and it, it almost uh, brought the, the, the nation to its demise within the first decade of governance. Um, and it narrowly escaped after the election of 1800 when there, there was a peaceful transfer of power. Um, in the 1850s, the first three threats um, came together and within a decade, it led to the Civil War. 
And then three threats combined again in the 1890s. And uh, I want to now focus on that period and what happened in the 1890s. So in the decades following the Civil War, democracy, for those who had the right to participate, was quite vibrant. It now included African-American men in the South who had gained voting rights and were participating at high rates in elections and running for office, primarily as Republicans. Um, now, by the way, as I'm going to talk about Republicans and Democrats for the next few minutes, it'll sound very confusing. <laughs> but, you know, the, the parties have changed over time. And if you want to think of this in the simplest possible way, which is, of course, an oversimplification, it's almost like the parties have traded places in terms of who their um, constituents were then and now. But yeah, so African Americans in the South were uh, Republicans at this time, and whites in the South, for the most part, were Democrats. Um, also, there was a, a new party on the rise in, in this period called the People's Party, or uh, which grew, grew out of the agrarian populist movement. And it too began to run candidates quite successfully. But at that very juncture, democracy was thrown into crisis. And by the way, this slide is showing you some of the first um, Black members of the U.S. Congress um, from the late 19th century. But I want to zoom into um, uh, North Carolina in the 1890s. There, Republicans and populists observed that if they would join forces, they could run candidates together on what they called a fusionist ballot. And then they stood a good chance of beating the Democrats, this party of the white elites. And that's what they did. In 1896, the fusionists managed to elect Republicans as governor of North Carolina and the majority of the state seats in the US House of Representatives and the state assembly. For Democrats, their worst fears had come to pass and they plotted their way back to power. In 1898, they staged a coup d'etat in the city of Wilmington. Now, Wilmington at that point in time was the state's largest urban area, and it was a success story for African Americans who were moving into the middle class. Three members of the Board of Aldermen were Black, as were numerous public sector employees. The Daily Record was a Black-owned newspaper, and as a daily, it was the only one of its kind in the nation. So democracy seemed to be on the rise until the morning of November 10th when nearly 2,000 white men who belonged to paramilitary groups gathered at the city armory. Now on the left here, um, this is a group called the Red Shirts. They were one of these uh, white paramilitary groups. And then another one was the White Government Union you see on the, the right there, um, one of their buttons. So these groups gathered, they marched to the offices of the Daily Record and they set the building on fire and they watched it burn. Um, and this slide is actually showing that, the offices of the Daily Record being burned. Then they advanced through Black neighborhoods, and as the day wore on, they murdered hundreds of people. They dragged prominent people from their homes and took them to the train station and made them leave town. And before the day was out, the coup uh, leaders then forced at gunpoint the resignations of the mayor and the aldermen and installed their own in their place. A few months later, the Democrat uh, party leaders statewide took measures to make their power permanent. They scaled back voting rights by establishing poll taxes and literacy tests. As one Democrat who was a state senator put it, he favored, quote, a good square honest law that will always give us a good democratic majority, end quote. What happened in North Carolina brought out into the open a major transformation that was occurring more quietly in states all over the South as white elites shut down the political opposition. The federal government, including Republican presidents, permitted this. In 1898, President McKinley heard the pleas of African Americans in Wilmington asking for help but failed to intervene. As disenfranchisement happened in state after state, President Theodore Roosevelt simply watched. Then President Taft went so far as to praise the restrictive rules for excluding what he called, quote, an ignorant, irresponsible element, end quote, from the electorate. By the end of the 1890s, all four pillars of democracy had suffered harm. The main result was the disenfranchisement of millions of Black men and some poor whites. Once blacks, lo blacks lost political power, their civil liberties and civil rights were taken away from them as well. And Jim Crow was established and it lasted 
60 years. And white Southern elites regained extra political power, not only to rule in their own states as autocrats, but also to exercise an outsized voice in national politics for the next half century. The politics of the 1890s reverberates in our own times. Then as now, we witness a high degree of polarization, rising economic inequality, both of which have been on the rise for decades. And some political leaders use conflict over who belongs um, in the form of race baiting and ethnocentrism to fuel anger and to promote political participation among white supporters. Threats combine with each other in dangerous ways. Um, and so if you look at, at uh, in, in the book, we deal with all of these different periods and you can see which threats were, um, were active in each of them. Um, but, and so, you know, the three threats together happened in the 1850s and the 1890s. The 20th century was a quieter period in that executive aggrandizement was on the rise and that was going on in the 1930s, 1970s, and I can talk about those periods if you like. Um, but things were contained because um, you, you didn't have all of these other threats um, combining with them. But now in this table, we combine uh, the contemporary period and you see that all four threats are, are on the rise today. Um, I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen here. Um, yeah, so all four threats are now um, raging at high levels. And that's because over the 20th century, the executive power of the presidency grew tremendously. Um, and uh, these powers do create opportunities for abuse while at the same time, they're obviously there so that presidents can respond to public needs and to attend to national security. Um, and you know, we, we saw that in Watergate, a president using the powers of the presidency for their personal gain and we've seen it again in the last few years. The rise of the four threats long predated President Trump, but he has not in intensified them, using the powers of the presidency to create larger partisan divisions and to fuel conflict over who belongs and to cater to the most affluent. Those threats have taken on a life of their own and, uh, and they really, they'd already taken on a life of their own before he was elected. We see uh, Trump as um, not the cause of these threats, but rather um, produced by them. And then he is in, his presidency has exacerbated them further. And we think that um, long after he departs from public life, that the United States is going to be is going to continue to see democracy careening, uh, to use a term that the comparativists use, because of all of these four threats raging. So American democracy, uh, or excuse me, American history reveals that we can't take democracy for granted. It has been fragile time and again, and now is another such time. The question for Americans must be how to make the preservation and restoration of democracy our top priority so that we can pass it on and strengthen it for future generations. So thank you. I will stop there. And I would love to talk with you about this book project or whatever else you would like to raise. Excellent, thank you. Um, that was great. I'm sure many of us will be um, purchasing this book now. <laughs> so I'm sure that these are, you know, kind of salient um, topics that a lot of people are, are having right now as it relates to not only Trump, um, but just kind of the future of, of the U.S. and in our democracy, like we're large. Um, so thank you very much um, for that presentation. Um, I definitely have a set of questions myself, but I want to allow, it looks like Alex has a question too. Um, so yeah, it's a perfect um, opportunity to kind of segue into questions, if that's okay with you, Dr. Mettler. Um, and as I mentioned, feel free to ask questions, be it about the presentation in this book um, and, and more generally. So Alex, feel free to go first. Yeah, and please, you. Um, when you introduce yourselves, tell me, you know, a little bit about, uh, you know, which, which program you're in and your interests as well. I'd love to hear that. All right. Um, thank you, Stephanie and uh, Dr. Metla. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, it was very um, informative. Um, so I am in my fourth year. I'm in the PhD program and I study mainly environmental policy and just basically using the policy process theories, including policy feedback. Great. 
So it's awesome to actually uh, meet you. Um, my question actually is on the notes that you ended. What do we do to right. deal with um, these threats? Mm -hmm. And I'm asking this question, this question, particularly as an uh, an international observer. <clears throat> so I come from Ghana, mm -hmm. and I mean back back in Ghana, America has always been the if you want the beacon of democracy that we all look up to, many African countries. And so um, with the actions of the current presidents and uh, how things are going, sometimes I receive calls from Ghana and they're asking me, Alice, what, what's going on? You know, what do we do? What do we, how do we rally around uh, the needed forces to be able to, if not deal with all these problems that are going, at least be able to minimize them so that we can continue to enjoy the freedom and uh, keep America there so that other countries can emulate that. Yeah, great. And, and that, is, that is the burning question, I think. <laughs> um, and I, I think um, what's important is to, to focus on that. I mean, I think, you know, all of us who care about public policy, you know, we get into this because we have particular things that we're, we feel really passionately about, whether it's, you know, environmental policy, for example, or social policy, or, you know, what have you. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, the pillars of democracy are even more fundamental than that, you know, because um, if democracy is, is lost, then the only people in society who will get what they want are the most affluent and powerful vested interests, and the vast majority of citizens will really be left out altogether. So to be able to you know to make public policy something that is really for the public it's essential to do that more primary work of safeguarding democracy and you know i think it's fair to say that um you know for for me growing up in the latter part of the 20th century um in the united states it seemed that that democracy was for the most part like these basic fundamentals were safe and they were becoming stronger in many ways and more robust um and um uh, but you know but we're now at a point where it's clear that they've they've really been um buffeted very strongly in these last few years and actually i mean s since our book went off to press which was last spring um so much more happened even during this summer i mean in the lead up to the election and this fall um you know i kind of had like a running checklist in my mind looking at danger to free and fair elections uh, danger to the rule of law um in those two in particular also the legitimacy of the opposition um and um, the integrity of rights so all of those things really need to be protected and to my mind that's what we need to just say again and again and again and we need to support um public policy changes that will protect those things i think scaling back the four threats is hard to do once the four threats have taken on a life of their own like political polarization it's tough to to reverse it um and you know i would have thought if anything could reverse it something like a pandemic might but instead it's made it even worse people are even more polarized coming out of the pandemic about you know like whether you wear a mask or not it's you know becoming affiliated with partisanship and etc but americans in polls will still say that they um believe in things like the rule of law and um free and fair elections etc so i think we need to try to build on that and to strengthen those things um and you know the challenges with any of these things is, is getting around partisanship. I mean, coming out of Watergate, um, Democrats and Republicans actually came together in Congress and created lots of reforms, um, which now have grown weak and need to be strengthened. The question is, you know, can, there, can we build will to do that now? But I think that whether or not that can happen at the national level, people can certainly work at the state and local level for those things. And that it's also a really important part of educating students. I mean, many of you will go on to be professors. And I think that um, it's an important uh, aspect of people's education to really learn that we can't take these aspects of democracy for granted and they need to be strengthened.
Thank you, Alex, for that question. Um, I would like to pose a question also, because I'm curious of your thoughts. Um, because because there's a lot of themes both in this book as well as some of the other books that you've written that I think are parallel and um, and I know that there's a, a piece of it is public opinion and the one and how that um, affects um, the state of our democracy but it's interesting to me because I think with social media and with technology in general um, I think the public is in some ways I mean there's a lot of misinformation out there but I also think that the public is learning more about the things that are happening um, that perhaps we wouldn't have been aware of. So, you know, we have Twitter, um, we have these like large protests that everyone's, you know, it's kind of hard to avoid knowing that they're happening um, with these viral videos of like police brutality, for example. Um, it's becoming in like increasingly easy and fast to learn about some of these things that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise been aware of. So I'm curious of what you think the role of growing sociopolitical awareness is actually having on the state of our democracy. Um, because I'm curious if it's if it's more the misinformation piece that's affecting it, or if it's actually like us becoming more aware of the actual frailties that perhaps were already there. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so um, I think what I, a good way for me to address this is by speaking about a project that I haven't yet published much from, and it's about the Affordable Care Act. And this is um, work that I'm doing with Larry Jacobs at the University of Minnesota and with Ling Zhu at the University of Houston. Um, we have conducted a panel study on the Affordable Care Act since 2010. So, um, you know, I'd long been, so, so for the, I, I'm assuming some of you know what policy feedback is and some don't. So just to give it in a, a nutshell, policy feedback is this theory that policies, once they're established, can reshape politics. And they can do it through all sorts of different mechanisms. But I'm particularly interested in how they, um, they can change citizens' attitudes, they can change public opinion, like what policies citizens care about, which policies they're mobilized to try to protect and defend, maybe because they benefit from them or people in their community benefit from them. Um, and policies can also shape the extent to which people participate in politics. Some, some policies can give citizens more skills or resources so that they participate more than they would otherwise. And so then you reshape political life through public policies. And often the policies had some other goal. They might have had to do with the environment or social policy or what have you, but they have these unintended consequences for, um, for citizens' participation. Okay, so that's policy feedback. And it's a recurring theme in a lot of my work, though not in the book, I'm not in four threats. Um, so, um, but at the same time, we've had growing political polarization in the United States. And that has made some scholars recently say, you know, policy feedback just cannot overcome the forces of political polarization. What happens now is that citizens' um, views of any issues and the way they participate in politics is totally shaped by their partisan priors. So people get new information and they channel it in a way that confirms <laughs> what they already believe based on their partisanship. Um, and, you know, even if a policy created by their political opponents benefits from them, they're still going to vote for their own party, etc. And so that's what scholars have been assuming. But in this project on the Affordable Care Act, where we have this panel data that we've been collecting five waves um, 2010 through 2018, we're able to actually test that and to find out what's more important, people's firsthand experience of a public policy or is it um, their partisanship? And so this is what we found in a nutshell. In the first few years of the implementation of the ACA, um, people were appreciating its benefits. Um, they were finding like their adult children up through age 26 now were covered by, um, you know, ACA benefits. Um, for senior citizens, it was reducing their drug costs. For other people who'd been uninsured, they were managing to gain insurance through expanded Medicaid and through the state exchanges, et cetera. 
Um, and so, and you know, people liked its impact on, on health insurance companies that couldn't throw you off once you get sick or your kids get sick, et cetera. Um, so people liked all those things, regardless of their partisanship. But that was not enough to make them change their overall e evaluation of the law. So people's evaluation about whether they were pro or con the Affordable Care Act was still staying the same for those first few years. But then what happened after 2016 um, was really interesting. So um, here we introduced the concept of political threat. So Republicans had been trying to, they had been running on wanting to kill the Affordable Care Act from the time it was enacted. Right, and this was helping them to do well in the 2010 elections and um, and 2014 uh, elections and um, and 2016, but by 2016, all of a sudden, it was actually possible for them to terminate it because now they've got Republican in the White House and they have majorities in both chambers of Congress, and uh, you may remember, you know the politics of that time that was so fascinating because once they finally had that power, they they failed actually to um, to kill the bill. You had John McCain giving his famous thumbs down um, in the well of the Senate, um, and so you know by by one vote the ACA survived. It's been like you know a cat with nine lives. It's been nearly killed many times. But then uh, the Trump administration went on to try to weaken it administratively um, through uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. So the bill is really under threat at this point in time. So. What happens at this point? Well, what we found in 2018 is that um, things changed. People at this point, people who had benefited from it um, and other people in the community who had been less aware of or appreciative of it previously began to become much more supportive of the Affordable Care Act. And um, those who were supportive became more luck likely to vote on the basis of their view of the Affordable Care Act. So in other words, um, the threat to the policy made it override political polarization. So this is a long way of saying that, <laughs> an answer to your question, Stephanie, I think we are in very polarized times where people's political information can generally speaking be shaped by partisanship. And yet, I also think that experiences of public policy do have the capacity to override partisanship. And whether or not it does depends on various things. And we found it depended on whether there's policy threat or not. I see. Um, yeah, I think it also, the visibility of a policy, how much are people really aware of what that policy is doing for them, all of that matters as well. Sure. That's important. I think that like just learning how those moderate, like what moderators are out there um, that would influence that. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I know we have a number of first year PhD students logged in. Um, so I just wanted to share that because I know that they're learning about policy feedback in Dr. Weibel's class, um, who teaches our policy class. So um, if anyone has any questions on that or otherwise, if you all wanna either physically raise your hand as Alex did or using the reactions. Um, I can call on you if you have any uh, additional questions for Dr. Mettler. If no one does, I do. Great. Uh, feel free, go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, Dr. Mettler, uh, pleasure to meet you. Uh, I am actually a alum of CU Denver. I am now teaching at Eastern Oregon University, um, and I'm teaching uh, public, uh, public administration to undergrads. Yeah. And um, my question is understanding that, so a lot of the focus is at the federal level, and you did mention that, you know, the local and state level could be perhaps avenues of, well, forgive me if I'm misinterpreting what you're saying, but local and state could be um, mitigating levels of governance to kind of uh, thwart this cream towards anti-democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you, of those four, um, trying to think, be like solution oriented, and this could be an opportunity for more grassroots uh, reform of institutions. What do you think of those four as the most promising um, uh, that could be mitigated at the local and state level? Um, 
Oh yeah. Oh, of the four pillars of democracy. Yeah. Oh, the 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 executive aggrandizement, the polarization. Where do you oh, see those of the four threats. Threats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the four threats. That is very tough. Um, you know, I mean, I I think that politics works better when people are involved locally and um and i think you know we've the nationalization of american politics has been problematic in lots of ways um i don't know if you know the book um on this very subject by uh daniel hopkins at penn he wrote a great book that came out a year or two ago about um uh let's see i have it right here, here we go the increasingly United States, <laughs> the increasingly United States. A handy thing about being in my own office, I can just pull a book off the shelf. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, when everyone just focuses on the national level, the politics becomes a lot more polemical. And, you know, the debate is always over these balance issues where you're just, you know, for or against, and there's not really room for negotiation. And it all becomes very abstracted from people's ordinary lives. Um, and so I think that um, getting involved locally can really help people to become, um, to have to, you know, uh, do the hard work of organizing and working with others who might have different views than themselves and becoming realists about what's possible in politics um, and you know which is the best thing for an idealist to do right and um, so uh, I, I think that um, that that would be actually helpful for all of these things for all four of them um, to, to, to reduce them that's my inclination to say that, yeah. Great, thank you. Yep. It's really interesting um, how, you know, thinking about the local level, I mean, state and local governments run elections, of course, and uh, it's been so fascinating over the past month to see you know, the continued efforts by Trump and many of Republicans at the national level and by his campaign staff to say that the elections were fraudulent. And then to have state and local leaders who are really doing the hard work of running elections and many of them themselves, Republicans, pushing back and saying, no, <laughs> this election had integrity and we actually ran it pretty darn well. And even where there's recounts of votes, um, you know, very small numbers of, of votes are actually changed. So that's quite extraordinary. And I think, um, you know, when people get involved at that level, like this year, there were a lot of people, um, including some of my family members who became poll workers and work, you know, did that work behind the scenes. And it's very illuminating once you find out how elections are run that, you know, um, all of, of, of the care that goes into that. Um, perhaps it should be, you know, something like jury duty that everybody has to do it at some point so that you um, understand what it's like. Um, but uh, I think, you know, if, if, if people had a better understanding of those things, they'd be less likely to um, assume that there's fraud in American elections. And as, as a teacher or as an instructor, we're, this could be the way we drive home that point to the students is that, you know, because in your mind's eye coming into a public administration class, you're thinking federal level and, and all the cynicism and, 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 and the things that go on at that level, but driving home, like at the local and state level, these are more practical solutions we're looking for. They're not the political. But yeah, absolutely. Right. No, it's really terrific. Uh, yeah, I mean, for my own daughter, who's a college student, it was fantastic for her. When one summer she came back home and she's interested, uh, like Alex, in environmental policy issues. And uh, she worked with local county government that was um, dealing with water issues. And uh, it was just fantastic to get involved in, you know, real practical kinds of solutions at the local level and to see what, um, what the barriers were to them um, being, you know, more effective. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's an area where you can really make a difference. So 
And, you know, obviously policy on all levels is important, but I think that, um, you know, one of the things we're facing in American politics these days is that in recent decades, I think a lot of people, particularly on the left, have become focused on the national level to the exclusion of the state and local level. I think conservatives have done a much better job of staying active on the state and local level, um, and people on the left have really ceded it to them in many ways. So, and I, I think that's a, a source of, of a lot of problems. That's interesting. I think that that is definitely a fair point. And in some of the research that I've been doing in Florida, it is interesting how at the state level they are um, like pretty active um, as it relates to even being able to kind of monkey around with different initiatives and different amendments as they're passed um, because they do have a very strong um, Republican state legislature. So it's it's really interesting how how active they are in terms of that kind of engagement. Um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, and you know, going kind of back to what you were mentioning earlier, Stephanie, about like what do citizens know and what are citizens aware of? Right. I think because of the way the contemporary media is, people tend to be more aware of what's going on at the national level than in their own states. Um, and you know, the demise of, of local newspapers has been really problematic in this regard. Um, so I, I think that's an area of concern as well. Sure. I have a question. Oh. It's, uh, well, it's changing gears, I guess, a little bit. Um, but I'm curious about your thoughts. Sorry, my name is Ariel. I'm a first year um, PhD student, and I'm interested in uh, social equity issues. Um, so, but previous to this, I worked in higher education for the last several years. And so I know you have a book on inequality in the higher education system that's, I, I guess, a few years old now. Um, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are with the administration change, um, what you see happening in the higher education system, or what you predict might happen in the next administration as it relates to higher education? Yeah, yeah, good question. So right, I had a book, it was in 2014, um, called Degrees of Inequality, where I looked at um, how, you know, we, the United States had um, really throughout the middle of the 20th century, well, the United States was creating this big, you know, states were creating this big system of public higher education um, very successfully. And then at the national level, we had these federal student aid policies um, that the United States was really expanding access to who got college degrees. And it was the leader of the world. And then in more recent decades, it fell behind. It really stagnated while several countries leapfrogged over us. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so I was looking at that and, um, you know, the question of what are the politics of this? Why haven't we done a better job? Um, and so, um, you know, there were, there were great efforts in the early Obama administration to improve things, um, but it's, there's a continued need to do so. I think it's, you know, it's a top priority. Um, and I think that, you know, the Biden administration would very much like to. Um, and the question is, will it be able to promote um, policies in a way that they'll have enough bipartisan support? Um, you know, po polarization is, is the big question of to, to what extent with a very divided Senate will, will action be possible. Um, my own view is that the emphasis by Democrats in recent years on free college um, has been misplaced. Um, so I think that in order to expand access to college and to expand college graduation rates, that it's more important to have policies that are really channeling resources to low and middle income students um, rather than students across the board. Um, and, uh, and I think that more tailored approaches are more effective at doing that um, more effectively and efficiently. Um, and uh, one area um, 
Well, I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things I would focus on if, if I were advising the Biden administration would be how to help states to um, devote more funds once again to their public universities and colleges because you know that, that those have been really just those funds have been decimated in recent years as states are attending to other things um, to to Medicaid to k-12 education to incarceration all of those areas are big areas for state budgets and um, and meanwhile um, public education really suffers. And um, Colorado, by the way, um, it's been a, a big problem in Colorado. Um, and so I think that uh, the federal government can use um, matching grant types of programs to try to encourage states to prod them to reinvest more, once again, in public higher ed by giving them um, some some funds to help make that possible. I would also recommend a strong emphasis on uh, regulating the for-profit colleges. And um, this is a big problem. I mean, only um, you know about one in ten American college students attends the for-profits. So at first, when I worked on that book project, I wasn't even paying attention to them. But then I began to realize that they're using a huge amount of federal student aid dollars, um, about one in four with disastrous consequences for many of the students who attend them. Many very low-income students who are the first in their family to go to college attend these colleges only to end up worse off than if they'd never gone in the first place because they end up so heavily indebted. Um, and so the Obama administration had worked very hard to create these gainful employment rules to try to regulate them. And then there's been great effort at scaling that back during the Trump administration. Um, and so I, I would want to um, revisit that issue. I think it's really important. Thank you. That's very insightful. But yeah, the nonprofit colleges and the, the debt that the students get into is really unfortunate. Yeah, the for, for profits. Yeah. Yes, sorry. For, yeah, profits. for profits. And yeah, I mean, they're traded on Wall Street. It's extraordinary. So, so they're benefiting the top 1% and really disadvantaging the most disadvantaged students the low-income students and first-generation students, and particularly students of color. They um, try to recruit very heavily in um, communities uh, with lots of African-Americans. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's a real social justice issue and needs to be addressed. I, for one, had no idea um, they were traded on Wall Street. That is... Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, no, the, the story of the four profits is I found when I wrote that book jaw dropping, absolutely jaw dropping. Um, and, um, and most people are not aware of them. Um, so yeah, it, it's a story that needs to be shouted from the rooftops, I think. Well, Dr. Mettler, we are just a bit over time. So thank you so, so very much for being with us today, um, for taking the questions. Thank you all for asking questions. Um, I think, you know, I think we all have a lot to think about and um, you definitely um, like helped our general understanding of, of our democracy and how we move forward. And, and um, I think there's a lot of uh, pieces that I think could be easily um, included in some of the work that we're doing and some of the research that we're conducting. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time and I'm, we're so glad that you agreed to do this. And um, it was great to have you and great to learn from, you know, your research and someone and, you know, outside of SPA and that kind of thing. So thank you all participants as well for coming and joining us today. Um, we really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll continue being in touch. Yeah, please do stay in touch. It's been wonderful um, being with you and uh, good luck to all of you and your programs.